and we walk towards that entrance and I walked through that entrance at the beginning and all of a sudden the water began to drop from my head and then my clothes which were clean before I came started to go dirty and it was dropping down, down to my legs and then the flat finished and then I started to go down and down and down and down I goes right down until we came to a flat at the bottom. The knowledge mothers and fathers had, the reality they lived through, led them in every fibre of their being to want an alternative life for their children. But for most, to live, there was no choice. We were seven kids, and only dad working, obviously struggling. He didn't want me to go down the pit. He didn't want one of us to go down. I, I flew three boys actually, but he wanted one of us down the pit. But anyway, I went down the pit. On and on we walked, until we walked up approximately a mile and a half. And then my father said, no, hang on by your nose. And I could see a horse, and a big white horse. And the Ollie was there, and he said, Hello, Di, you brought him in today, have you? And then, of course, Come on, Tom, come in me now. I'll show you the place. And he walks down this first road, and it is dipping down, and it goes down to the face. And when it goes down to the face, I could only see six inches of coal I could see. But when I went further, I was one for six in water myself. It was full of water. And my father said, get out of there, get out of there, he said. You, you, you're going too fast. And he called the Ollie and he said, bring, a, bring a, uh, something down here to get his water out. It was all prehistoric work. You were working with a mandrel and a shovel. You were cutting coal uh, with a, just a mandrel, right? And then you dragged it back in a box and put it into drums and fit pill about four or five drums in your day, you were doing all right. I was working in about that height at that time, two foot four. The Collier's day, in terrible conditions often, was about skill and graft and it was long. On the way out, I'm walking and walking and walking and then I get to the bottom before going to the surface. And in the distance, I could see the light. And as I walked and walked, it grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I came to the top and it came out right into, into, into the sunshine. And they did, oh, it was a beautiful day. My mother was waiting at the bottom. How did it go, Tom? No bad, ma'am. But I felt rotten. I went in. I had a bath in front of the fire. I had some food. And I went to bed. And I didn't rise the next morning. <laughs> there was one sound that would be worse than the whistle of the hooter and that was the silence which afflicted the Rhondda when the mass unemployment of the 1920s proved immovable. We've been told for many ages that our business is to work for the old starvation wages paid to us by those who shirk. But a feeling now is rising that those days have gone for a, and the workers are surprising all the bosses when they say when the boss starts working after years of shirking we will get the new world that we're striving for all we'll make we'll keep then Dogs of war will sleep then. Come along and join our ranks in the old class war. It was pretty tough for all families in the Rhonda because the men w weren't working 
for about six months in 1921. Yeah. Then we had the lockout in 1926, there was another six months. Well, there was no financial assistance available for the men and the miners' lodges had run out of money very early, you see. But the co-op, they were able to borrow from the cooperative wholesale society nationally and use that money to pay for the food that they were buying and they were selling. They were, well, they weren't selling it to us, they were giving it to us. And they, all they asked was that at, after the strike we would stay spending with them so that they, instead of giving us dividend for a couple of years, they could use what would have been paid out as dividend to discharge their debt to the CWS. During the um, Depression years, the 1920s, everybody in Mardi was, they were in the same boat, same circumstances, and nearly everybody uh, took in either lodges or what we call apartments, another family, to help to subsidize the rents and the rates. So my mother took in well, families, there was one family with four children. Well, our house has got four bedrooms, so they had two bedrooms. The father and mother were in one, the four children were in another bedroom, then my mother and father was in one bedroom, and then I was in the very smallest room of the house. But the, honestly, everyone did it to, um, to gather in a bit of extra money. You used to buy a sheep's head and some beef and uh, boil it and uh, put gelatine in it and pressed it and then it's, when it was um, cold then and hard we used to um, they used to slice it and we used to have that with uh, make a dinner or for a tea time. The men used to go up and dig levels into the mountain to get coal because you found levels dug all over the mountains they get coal down probably sell a bag for sixpence just to get some money they used to use leaves from the railways, I mean, bake it in an oven to smoke. That's known as baco dye. It's a smell horribly. But we used to use it to smoke things because we couldn't afford to buy them. It, uh, but we managed to keep together. And you appreciate the health of the, the mothers, uh, especially who were suffering at this time, because the mothers being so generous, they would uh, go without, especially food, so that the children could have an extra helping. And it was to make its toll on, on their health. And many a mother had to be brought into hospital uh, suffering from anemia and malnutrition. And of course, with that, uh, what follows, of course, uh, babies are born uh, with uh, different deformities and uh, rickets uh, was uh, the name that came up on uh, medical records and it was affecting the unborn child and then the child after it was born. Well, you have to go to the soup kitchens and they we never went. So I think because my father wasn't on strike. He was on the railway. So the miners were on strike then. Uh, and we wouldn't go to the soup kitchen, but we couldn't go because my... And of course I used to get mad because I wanted to go to the soup kitchens, like the other children, to have soup or whatever they were having from there. But we couldn't go. You know, we had to survive somehow. We had soup kitchens. When I was a child, we had to go to the local soup kitchens. I had uh, a pair of boots given me once by uh, passers that were sent to Mardi for the underprivileged and I had to wear the boots, they were lace up boots and I wore them. <laughs> the thing I remember most of all that hit me was uh, with the unemployed and there were organisations in London helping to collect old clothes to send down and the central hall in Tonopandi was a distribution point. And how it hurt the pride of those men to have to go there to pick up an old suit, old pair of boots, something like that. They, they didn't want it, but they had to do it. For the Ronda, the years between the wars was a long march. When the school holidays came, we took to the mountain tops, joining the liberated pit ponies among the ferns on the broad plateau. That was the picture for us who were young. For our fathers and mothers. There was the enclosing fence of hinted fears, fear of hunger, fear of defeat. And then, out of the quietness and the golden light, partly to ease their fret, a new excitement was born. The carnivals and the jazz bands. 
the experience was truly an incredible one. The carnivals and the later hunger marches were as much about mutual support as they were about play or protest. These trace memories of the 20s and 30s have never left Ronda minds and hearts, and no one ever recalled it better than Gwyn Thomas, and no one was more scornful of the technical Hollywood version. Yet before How Green Was My Valley worked its particular myth and magic, the cinema had brought to the Ronda a film hero as emblematic as its own life. Paul Robeson, whose progressive politics had led him to an acquaintance with miners and who made Proud Valley just as another world war came to alter run the lives yet again. I remember the Americans. I remember the Americans coming here before D-Day, playing in the street. I remember them playing with these great big... I'd never seen a glove as big as that in my life, a huge glove. They were playing... Um, baseball. They were playing yeah. baseball, you know. And then they used to form up a march up to a place where they all had food, and they were and they were very generous. That's where the term uh, "any gum sham." And the kids would go rub, running up the street after the, after the um, American soldiers, you know, soldiers out in any gum sham. Apparently, a lot of the boys, a lot of the American boys at the station in the valleys died in the big assaults on the Omaha beaches, you know. Only a stoical people could live through yet another round of human disaster on this scale. Sudden and mass death, even in peacetime, had cursed Ronda, even in Ronda. Yet, day by day, the constant toll of accidents underground was met with a counterpointing humour. In a coal mine, all first aid trained men could administer a pain relieving drug called pethidine. But the only civilians who could do it, I understand, you know, on a surface, it's a doctor or a, a state registered nurse. But we got this power in the coal mines. And we have a casualty out here on, uh, on a stretcher, splinted up, ready to take out. And of course, we need volunteers now to carry this man out. Well, there's always an abundance of volunteers to carry a stretcher case out, because it means an early shift, you know. But they'll ask a question first at the cold face, is he a bigger or a little one? You know, if he's a big one, there's nobody uh, coming forward uh, as quick as they would if it's a small one, so then we might up, you know. And humour comes into that situation straight away, you know, because it's going to take about three hours to get this casualty out from the mine, you know. And uh, we want to stop him going into shock. And some of the things that uh, the boys say to him to wind him up, you know, to keep his uh, spirits up in, is unbelievable, you know. And if it's a youngster who's had an accident, you know, he might be on a stretcher ready to uh, 
be taken out and the boys will say, well, them trainers were a waste of money, weren't they? You've been crutches for six months, you know, I'll give you 20 pounds for them. You know, and he said, oh, but this humour's kept up all the way out, you know. And if the accent that before he's had his lunch, you know, and we carry over our food underground in tin boxes to stop the mice eating him, you know. Well, the boys have opened his Tommy box, you know, they're eating his sandwiches and saying things like, dude, I'm on a Friday, you know, she must think a world of you, you know, and, uh, but this humour is carried on all the way out, you know, it's unbelievable to describe, really, unless you've been involved in mining, you know. We can never, we could go on for hours talking about the things where I come home from work and my mother said to me, why are you holding your stomach? Because I've been laughing so much. Just imagine coming out of a seam, less than a yard high, with water in it, bad roof, walking two and a half miles to get to the coal face in heat and things like that, and coming home and holding your stomach because you've been laughing so much. So how can you possibly put the two together? You know, it should be a contradiction, the, you know, the grim past. But no, miners were a superb bunch of men.